Okay, well, while we're still having a couple more people filter in, um, this, these slides are all available online at this URL. Um, I'm not live casting the actual slides from the website, but you can download this repository and just open the index.html file that's there, and it'll be the whole thing that we're looking at. Um, it's done with reveal, so you kind of um, have to poke around with your brow, you know, use your keyboard commands to get between the different sections of the slides. But um, yeah, let me keep that slide up now that you guys are here. Um, so if you write this down, we, we have a lot of detail in this presentation that we won't be able to cover fairly, and I don't want you having to type URLs. Um, so if you just remember that repository or write that down now, you should be able to grab uh, everything that we show you today, uh, including the, the code samples. Correct. Be sure to introduce, be sure to introduce yourself. No. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna get started now. Um, my name is Sean Walbridge. Um, I am a developer on the geoprocessing team. Um, I work mostly in Python, but also some in R. And I'm Kevin Butler. Uh, I'm a product engineer on the spatial statistics team supporting Esri Science Initiative. And uh, yeah, we've been giving this a version of this talk for a few years now, um, but it's really exciting to kind of see it come to fruition, right? The, the, the plenary, we got to see some really great stuff that's sci-fi based. Uh, the keynote speaker, you know, a lot of that work is, is integrating this technology. Um, so we're kind of showing you the things today that you get in the box as part of the experience of using pro or, or desktop or server. Um, but, you know, this, this stack is growing in a lot of places with people who work with Esri software. So we're glad to have you here and hopefully we can show you some cool new things. Um, so first we're just going to start with a little bit of a background on the scientific computing space and I'll let Kevin lead us into that. Yeah, this is kind of a strange terminology to be embedded inside of a GIS company. But really what, what we're doing as we're enhancing the platform is our goal is to make our GIS the ArcGIS platform, a full platform for e-science. And this really incorporates all of the aspects of scientific investigation. If you remember from your junior high days, this is really the scientific process brought into the modern age. This is e-science, where all aspects of data acquisition, data management, the visualization, the analysis, and the sharing um, are really brought together into one kind of nice organized piece of software. We have to believe that that piece of software is the Esri platform, but it allows you to do all aspects of scientific computing within the Esri platform itself. No longer do you necessarily have to go out and blend five or six different software packages together. Yeah, and we also have a lot of organizations who are using ArcGIS as a system of record. So this might mean that you're combining data and analysis from many different places, and only maybe part of that is in you know, the Esri ecosystem. You might be connecting together analytical workflows from all over the place. But that system of record piece of this means that whatever you can do to get more people to participate in it is a better story, right? So some of the work we've done with R recently is part of that. And some of this work we're doing with the scientific Python stack is really in that same space. And part of the, the reason that we want to have this happen is that we only can support, you know, so many tools. This is actually, this is, I should have updated this, but there's over 1,200 GP tools now. We are adding to it all the time, uh, but they never can solve every problem, right? So this is an extension point, which can allow you to get much deeper than is possible for us to do alone, right? We can only... You know, it can scale at some amount, uh, not in the way that this whole community can. Okay, so just a little bit of background about Python. I imagine most people here are at least know what it is, and um, I don't have to go through this too much, but uh, you know, why do we like Python, right? It's really accessible to newcomers. It's the most taught language in US universities at this point. It has a very broad collection of packages available to it. Uh, I think this, this 56K number is probably a little out of date now as well and a really broad user base which covers many different domains. There's some domain specific languages um, out there for, for dealing with scientific problem solving, but Python's really great because you can use it for some data munging, some scientific application, and making a blog, and it works perfectly well for all those different places. And part of that has really shown itself in this ability to become a really strong glue language. 
you might have different things you're doing in different environments, and many different pieces of software have kind of coalesced around using Python as the way to connect together the pieces that they do. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things to like about it. It's also open source. It's easy to use, do what you want with. Um, but I guess, you know, one of the things I think is so powerful about it is that you can get people to come to the table and use it who don't consider themselves to be computer scientists, right? It doesn't require the depth of knowledge in programming to get you started and get you productive in it. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of great things going for it. Um, we have a lot of resources at the end of this presentation that give you deeper insight into some of these areas and where you might want to go depending on, on, your, on your interest and, and where you want to go next. Uh, we won't cover all, all the material we can in the interest of time. But a little bit about what we have today in the box of ArcGIS, right? So just to give you a little bit of a recap, we have a Python API for driving ArcGIS desktop and server through ArcPy, right? We have embedded in the application, we have a Python window. We have, in, you have the ability to make Python add-ins to have Python toolboxes. We have a bunch of extensions. We have a modular framework for dealing with that. And an important thing you've probably seen a number of places this week has been the ArcGIS API for Python, right? So we're doing a lot of different things with Python, and um, it's really just continued to become a more and more important part of our platform story. There's a number of things specific to ArcGIS. We're shipping the latest release of Python with, the, with Pro 2.1. Um, there's a little bit of a difference. If you're using 10x, then you have Python 2. If you're using Pro, then you have Python 3. Um, and there's some places where there's a little bit of a distinction between those because the underlying data model of those applications is different. So if you're in desktop, if you're in ArcMap, the very top level thing you have is a map document. And everything that, so ArcPy mapping deals with map documents. But if you're in Pro, the very top level thing is a project. So we kind of had to change some of the interfaces to, from on the ArcPy side to match what's going on at the application level. Um, but we're always adding modules. Uh, Jim McKinney mentioned this in the plenary. Um, we continue to add a lot. We, we're up to about 70 now in Pro. And so the nice thing here is that, and what we're kind of showing you today, is these are things that you can take and use. And you know that if someone else has ArcGIS, they're going to have all that out of the box, right? You don't even need to do any modification, make changes, use Conda. It's not necessary. You have all these things just immediately available to you. We also have a number of all kinds of different extension points. One of them is this idea of raster function change. You can embed Python code in these really rapid ways of evaluating entire rasters on the fly. Um, they have examples. And that uses SciPy under the hood for some of its analysis. We won't go into details on that, but just know that by learning some of these tools, you get to kind of branch out into a lot of different areas through, through gaining some of that knowledge. Um, kind of said some of this already, but basically we're focusing on the things that are in the box today. Um, and also just this general story of you're moving away from code that's kind of throwaway code, right? You write it once and then you get your, your figure or your analysis results and then you forget about it and then you come back to it and you're like, who wrote this code? You know, you, you try to move toward the point where you have something that's maintainable and you don't have to do the same work. You know, one of the jokes about programmers is they're lazy, right? They want to get something done so they don't have to repeat themselves later. Um, and, and we've done a lot with multidimensional data. We won't go too much into that uh, today because we have a lot of stuff to cover. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting area. We'll show you some of the numpy stuff which really is about multidimensional data uh, today in, in, Arc, in ArcGIS. OK, so I mentioned this term SciPy without describing what it actually is. Um, and oh, it looks like this is a little bit unorganized here. Uh, so this is the, the, the SciPy stack is this descriptive term that basically is about taking Python, this general purpose programming language, and making it into this full-fledged scientific computing environment, right? So there's been a bunch of pieces that have grown up around Python to make this possible. The first really major piece of this puzzle was NumPy, and we're gonna talk about that, but that's these multi-dimensional array, arrays. And it turns out that a lot of people need a multi-dimensional array structure, and it's something that differentiates it from like, say, C, or some other language which doesn't have that, that, that people have coalesced around. Um, and we're going to talk about all these different pieces of the stack. There's a couple that didn't make it on this image. There's also, kind of at the edge, there's now IPython and Jupyter are two of the newest pieces of the stack. 
But the idea is this stack gives you the minimum set of capabilities you need to do interesting scientific analysis with Python. So we ship this um, and it's available to you. It's all open source stuff. You could take it and, and do it without ArcGIS as well, but we're gonna show you some of the integration points and how it can, can work well with, with some of the things we do. Um, so just to give you a sense of like, this is very much open source community driven projects. These are just um, some numbers here, but the thing I kind of want to bring your attention to is just the number of people involved, right? These are unique contributors for each of these projects. It's a lot of people are working on this, participating in this space, and it spans many, many, many different domains of science. Some of these people are, you know, they're plasma physicists, and some of them are working at CERN, and some of them are, you know, they're doing plot science ecology, or they're economists. They, they span many, many different domains. They're all contributing in small ways to this collection of packages. So you get a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of steam behind some of these, these efforts here. Um, let me see, I, I, I guess that other slide is just, uh, we'll come back to the SciPy. I don't know why it, was showed, showed, it showed up in the wrong place there. Um, but so SimPy is one of these pieces of this stack. Um, we're gonna kind of talk about them in an order that it's, it's a little bit isolated in some ways. Uh, it doesn't relate as well to the rest of the system. We're gonna talk about it first, even though it's a little bit more of a sophisticated piece of the stack. Um, so it's a computer algebra system. If you've ever used like uh, Mathematica or, or, or a system like that, uh, it's, kinda, it's in that space, right? You can have an equation that is a, a formal mathematical definition of what that equation is, and then it knows how to do things on that, right? It can differentiate. Here, uh, we have a very simple equation. We've asked it to define a symbol called x, and then we're gonna just define uh, you know, an equation with some terms um, based on x. And now we can ask this equation solver, oh, it looks like it, it's not readable on the screen here. Let me see if I can shrink this for a second. No, I have no control over this x size. Well, you can imagine that below this, you would see the two answers to this particular system of equations, or a single equation. Um, and it would show up, if I, if I switch really back and forth, you can see that maybe we can read it. No. Okay, so I think there's so one real and two imaginary answers to this particular equation. Uh, I'll fix that in, in the, uh, the GitHub repository. But so it, it knows how to do these kinds of things. This is the most basic possible thing I can show you, but uh, Kevin will show you something a little bit better than this. Thanks, Sean. Um, Simpy is a little bit um, out in left field. Um, most, lots of folks use SciPy. Not a lot of people are comfortable leveraging the power of, of SimPy. Um, I work on the spatial statistics team. I often need to rapidly prototype things, get things out of statistical journals, and they don't provide me with closed form solutions for things. Um, they just write these huge mathematical equations. I don't want to go through the effort of converting those into Python syntax. So we can just use SimPy to very quickly evaluate these things. So let's look at a quick example of that. <clears throat> Let me just do a little housekeeping here. So let's suppose that, um, let me show you some of the power of the statistical side of SimPy. And these examples were gleaned from Matthew Rockland uh, through his dissertation work who actually contributed um, a lot of the content to, to SimPy itself. So let's assume that we went outside and we took a, and we guessed at the temperature. I'm from northeastern Ohio, beautiful spring day. It's probably about 30 degrees outside. And I can adjust it, I can judge the temperature, say, within plus or minus three degrees. So I'm gonna model that within SIMPI and just say I expect temperature to be normally distributed. I think that the temperature is 30 degrees. It could be plus or minus 30 degrees. So I wanna know what is the probability that the temperature will be greater than 33 degrees? When are things gonna start melting? Well, that's actually the formula right there in order to calculate that probability. I don't wanna calculate that by hand. It's been way too long since I've had to do calculus. Um, I don't wanna translate that in, into, into Python uh, syntax in order to do it. So I can use, use SIMP's integration engine and actually calculate that. Symbolically, that's what that equation evaluates to. Still not very useful to me, then I can actually ask SimPy 
to generate that. And that's the probability that the temperature would be greater than 33 degrees um, outside. Very quick way to evaluate these symbolic expressions. Now what if I had multiple measurements taken at the same location? And you want to find ways to integrate those two measurements together. I've got my measurement of 33 degrees, and it's got some uncertainty associated with it. And let's say I go outside and I actually have a thermometer this time, and I measure the temperature, and it's 26 degrees outside. I didn't do too bad of a job guessing at the temperature. And I know the accuracy of that thermometer is plus or minus 1.5 degrees. So I want to combine these two things together, these two measurements together. Think of the applications for that. You've got data streaming in. You already have an estimate for, say, a polygon. You want to use uh, additional data streaming in to update those kinds of things. So I can create another distribution here where I'm adding some noise to this. So if I want to combine those two measurements together, my 26 that I got with the thermometer, my 30 that I was guessing, this is actually, in a Bayesian framework, how I might combine those two temperature measurements together to get a single measurement of temperature, but taking into account the measurement error of when the 26 was measured and when the 30 was guessed at. Again, I don't want to go ahead and code those things. I can ask SimPy to calculate those for me. I'm creating a posterior distribution. Let's just see if this will evaluate on my system. There we go. That's what I probably would have had to have translated into Python syntax. And combining those two measurements together, I actually get a measurement of the temperature outside of about 26.8 degrees. A lot easier to do this in a symbolic form when I'm working with actual equations rather than writing the Python code in order to integrate those things. Awesome. Thanks for that. I'm in Palm Springs right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So there's some other pieces of the stack that, again, are kind of a little bit differentiated that we're not going to get into too much detail here. One of them is this matplotlib library. There's been a lot of changes to the plotting capabilities in Python, the Python ecosystem in the last few years. Um, matplotlib has been around for a long time. It's kind of like a drop-in replacement for the plotting that's available in MATLAB. Uh, so it can do nice plots. It's widely used. I'll show you a couple examples a little bit later in the presentation. But we also wanted to mention a new feature, uh, ArcPy chart. Yeah, this is uh, actually the full version of this uh, charting module is coming out in Pro 2.2. The early pieces are there if you want to experiment a little bit. We've added charts to the standard UI within Pro. We had it in 10x. Charting was something that um, <clears throat> we've only brought over recently from ArcMap. We provide basic types of charts of line charts, bar charts, histograms, um, and one other chart type I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but those are very easy to create in the UI, but keeping with our idea of being able to automate and that Python is the primary scripting with the preferred scripting language for desktop, we've given you the ability to create these charts with a very simple charting interface within Python. Um, so if you're building a customized GP tool, you can actually create customized charting output at the same time, and those will be added to your table of contents along with the output of your GP tool. Cool. All right, so now we're going to kind of get back to the really core part of this story, which is around NumPy, and specifically how NumPy interacts with, with ArcGIS. Um, so what is NumPy? I, I mentioned it already. It, it has three different things embedded in it, but two of them are kind of just ancillary. The, the real core idea is it's this array object of an arbitrary collection of homogeneous items. Sounds so fun. But it just means that you have this multidimensional array. It can have many different types. These could be strings. They could be all kinds of things. But it's a way of concisely representing that, right? It knows how to have a bunch of floating point numbers or integers or Booleans. 
and it can represent it in a way that is consistently used across the Python ecosystem. Um, the other, and, and then some fast mathematical operations on it, those are important. So they can do things like uh, summarize, it can, it can do any uh, basic matrix algebra, that all happens in NumPy itself. The random number generation, uh, probably, it's really part of SciPy, um, it's just that NumPy predates it, so it, they, they are also some random number generation in NumPy itself. Um, so there's a story for integrating this with the rest of ArcGIS. And you know, this is important because if you're working with this broader SciPy stack, you have the data that you already know how to work with that's inside of ArcGIS, right? You have feature classes, tables, rasters. You can use these conversion functions to go from any of those types directly into these NumPy objects. They're low level, right? They're just a collection of numbers or, or data. Um, but the thing that's really powerful about this is that this means now you have the ability to take any data that you know how to work with in ArcGIS and push it into the rest of the scientific computing, uh, this Python scientific computing stack. And uh, just to give you kind of a flavor for when you might want to do that, if you saw the keynote speaker and uh, what's going on with Microsoft and this GeoAI VM that we have uh, stood up now, you might imagine that you have data that's in ArcGIS you know how to work with, and you want to do, you know, you want to do some of the new hotness, right? Some of the machine learning pro pro uh, uh, problem solving. And so for that, you want to get your data into a structure that it knows. It will know NumPy. That's kind of this, this unifying factor across the Python ecosystem. So, you know, if it's, if it's PyTorch or if it's uh, Cognitive Toolkit, any of these things, TensorFlow, they all know how to read NumPy arrays. So this gives you an easy way of interoperating with those kinds of environments. And maybe that, you know, the machine learning algorithm's happening purely on the GPU or on a cluster of CPUs. You don't really care. You kind of have this nice way of taking all your data in a way you know, using that infrastructure, and getting back something that you can consume with the rest of your, your platform. Okay, so we mentioned NumPy, that's kind of the most basic thing. There's also the SciPy, right? This additional module for dealing with problems that people dealing with scientific data have. There's a lot in here. There's a ton of things. It does many, many different things from different areas. Um, I think for most people, they maybe hit one or two of these areas with any given problem. But it can do everything from Fourier transforms to doing some uh, complicated statistics. We'll show a quick example that touches on statistics and multidimensional image processing. But uh, we can't really go into any detail on this. I just know it's comprehensive and that a lot of it's well-written, very optimized mathematical, numerical code. And the nice thing, too, is that um, sometimes you run code and you're like, what just happened? Like, like how do I, if I'm going to talk to someone else about this, how do I communicate about what I did or what version of what I did is? Well, one thing, it's open source, so you can look at the code. That helps. The other thing is that the documentation is very solid, right? It includes references for the methods that were implemented, where they got those, you know, reference implementations from sometimes. So you kind of are on a nicer position from just have, having someone throw some code over the wall and telling you to trust them. Um, you can kind of dig a little deeper if you want to. OK, so I just want to start with a very basic example of why you might want to use something like this. And again, this is kind of that extensibility story, right? There's a lot of stuff you could just use, just using things that we provide in ArcPy or directly from the GUI. Um, but sometimes you need something a little bit further, and this is just one example. Someone posted on GeoNet and said, you know, I need to calculate a, GeoNet, uh, a geometric mean of an entire raster, and there's no function for doing that inside of ArcGIS. So this is all you would need to do to get to that. We import the SciPy stats module. We have a raster that we know how to work with. In this case, it's a TIFF file, but it could be a file geodatabase, anything that ArcGIS knows how to deal with. And then on the third line, we're going to ask the raster to NumPy array conversion function to take that data and convert it into a NumPy array. And then all we need to do is just ask SciPy stats to give us a, a G mean. And I, there's some not so great namespacing here. It's scipy.stats.stats. Um, but scipy.stats.stats.g mean is going to give us back this geometric mean. And then you, know, you have this multidimensional cube of data potentially. Uh, in this case, we're saying flatten it all out. We just want to treat it like it's all just one data source. Um, so that's where this axis none is coming from. And we pass it our data, and we get back the value. So it's, um, 
it's a, it's a really nice environment. Um, there's you know some things to learn, like this access idea. Sometimes you want to get data across the rows or across the columns or at a depth. You sometimes want to get your summaries at different levels of that cube. So that's what that is about, you're being able to do that. OK, and then I also have an example with Benthic Train Modeler. Um, what is Benthic Train Modeler? It's a Python add-in and toolbox for geomorphology. I'm one of the developers of it. Um, you can go check it out now. It has some nice patterns in it. It's actively used in the geomorphology community. Um, we just published a paper about it uh, that kind of shows how you can use it. And, and we use uh, SciPy Stack for a lot of that analysis. And it also integrates with, with some uh, R statistical methods as well. Um, and I just wanted to show you a very quick example of where we use it in BTM. So we're going to be using this ND image, this lightweight uh, n-dimensional image format, and also using SciPy stats as well to show you uh, a piece that it can do there. So here's a very simple example of doing something with, uh, with, with SciPy. And what we're doing here, again, it's the same thing we just saw last time, right? We re read in the raster, we convert it to a NumPy array, but this time we're only going to get a little tiny box. We just want a little 200 by 200 piece of this raster. This raster might be giant. We just want to sample it. We want a little box. And then we're going to use matplotlib, which I mentioned earlier, to get an image of that output, right? We don't want to look at a, at a giant text file of all the values, uh, which is fun sometimes, but it's usually nicer to look at an image. And then there's a second part to this. We're going to go over this different window size, and we're going to look at this raster as we interpolate it, as we run a median filter at different scales, right? So we're trying to here get a visual indication of the effect of scale on this data, and the, there's um, what, what are some of the critical scales? There's some more sophisticated analytical tools for doing that, but this is a very simple way of getting a basic, uh, a, a basic way of looking at that directly. So we just run those commands, and then we get something like this, and it's, it's cut off because I don't know, the, the size doesn't seem to be quite exactly right. But basically starting up in the upper left-hand corner here, we're at, you know, we're at three by three, three by threes in that corner. And then we're going all the way to 75 by 75. So up here, you know, that's just like, that looks like the data itself. There's very little going on. But if you kind of start going, you start seeing some of these features drop out, right? So somewhere around here, you know, some of the very fine-grained features have dropped out. We're getting kind of a more general trend. You can kind of see some general gradient going on a diagonal here, and but we still have a lot of detail. And then when we get somewhere down here, somewhere you know in the 50s here, now we're kind of getting this very smooth terrain, and we've lost a lot of that detail. So there's a number of applications where you need to kind of find uh, multiple scales where certain phenomena happen, and something like this can do that, right? And that was, you know, that was less than 10 lines of code. That was real. There was no like secret import that I didn't show you. That's all the code it took to make this image. Another just quick example is if you're doing something like dealing with circular variables, right? You can't, if you have time or these kinds of variables, you can't just add them up because if you have, like in this case, we're dealing with aspect. Um, if you have something at one degree and 359 degrees, if you average that, you don't get the, the right thing, right? Um, so we can use something like SciPy to help us with that as well. So we basically can ask it for circular statistics, circular mean, circular standard deviation, and again, the namespacing is, this is stats.morestat. A little unfortunate, but it, it works. It does a great job. Um, and I'm not going to show you that. Those are just numbers that came out of that. But we're able to calculate back out the values of that without having to do any, any real deep work there. OK, and now we're going to switch back to Kevin and show you some more in-depth work with, with sci-fi. Much to my chagrin. Yeah. So uh, a, a fun little example. Uh, we're here at the Esri Developer Conference, so I'm assuming that lots of you are working on spatial applications. Uh, one method that exists within SciPy that I found handy is a similarity test for two spatial data sets. And this method is called Procrustis. Um, and I had to figure out the meaning of that word. Uh, Procrustis is from mythology and was a, a wolf in sheep's clothing and would offer weary travelers um, a bed to rest for the night. But Procrustes' bed was only one size, so he would cut his travelers and make them fit or stretch them in order to make them fit within the bed itself. And that's exactly what this method is doing. It's a shape analysis. Another word for this is morphometrics. So it's shrinking and growing and rotating and transforming 
two different spatial data sets to see if they're indeed similar to each other. Um, I've seen lots of applications for this, and the most unique one that I've seen recently um, is that cities are buying left and right is identifying graffiti tags, gang tags that actually exist within gra graffiti. So there's an actual whole library of these images out there. And what folks do is, often through digitizing, they'll just very, very roughly capture the key aspects of that tag itself. Then you can compare that to a database of known tags. And even if the tag is bigger or smaller or rotated, um, through Procrustis analysis, you can actually identify um, those, those kinds of gang tags. So let's look at an example here. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping and show you the very simple data set that I'm working with. I've got two point data sets here. Those two things look exactly the same to me. So I'm hoping any similarity metric is indeed going to give me zero between those two things. But I could have tested that with my eye. Looking at those two data sets again, I think A and B have the same spatial pattern. B is just scaled differently. Okay? But I still want to be able to say that these two things are the same. And again, it does because the Procrustis method, um, I've set it to actually um, do scaling. It sees that these things are the same. So this time, if I'm looking at A and B, those are exactly the same pattern, but their origins are just shifted a bit. And I get the answer that I expect. I expect patterns A and B to be exactly the same. Okay, what if I give it different shapes? Clearly A and B are not the same in this example. And I'm starting to get a dissimilarity of a dissimilarity metric where I can see that they're different. Let's give that a little bit of a stronger difference. Here, A and B are clearly different. And my dissimilarity metrics, my Procrustis metric, actually went up. So think about this for any kind of features um, that you might extract from a remotely sensed image. And you want to see if those same patterns exist in other locations. Um, really, the comparison of any two um, key point patterns, those location points, these points that you're seeing in red and blue, those can be derived from images. Those can be um, <clears throat> patterns in, say, urban morphology. Um, I can think of lots of applications. Um, a fun one might be a poor man's version of facial recognition. So I like to pick on my colleague. So we've got three versions of Sean here. So uh, on the left here, we have um, soap opera star Sean. In the middle, this is GQ Sean. And on the right, this is geographer Sean. So, and this has kind of been Sean over the last 10 years. Something like that, yeah. Um, and I want to see how differently Sean looks in these images. I can't do a direct comparison of the images because you can see he's got the, the typical over-the-shoulder soap opera pose here going on and less vain look here straight on. So what I've done is I've just quickly digitized some of the key ass points, anchor points of Sean's face. Two eyes, nose, and chin, a very, very simple measure. And then I've done a Procrustis dissimilarity difference between them. So between soap opera Sean and GQ Sean, it's a pretty small number. Uh, but then when you look at soap opera Sean and go over to geography Sean, it's saying those images are essentially the same. Okay. Could have just been a little bit of maybe digitizing error on the bottom of the chin there or something. But I hope you can see many applications for this. Really, anything that you can turn into a set of anchor points, you could put into the Procrustis uh, algorithm with just 
five, ten little lines of code there and get a good dissimilarity metric, um, metric between them. Cool. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to switch back for one second, just tell you what this is and then show you back on Kevin's machine. But basically, uh, one of the things that we've just introduced is one of the last pieces of SciPy stack. If you have a new version of Pro uh, with 2.1, uh, we've added this IPython. So you often hear IPython and Jupyter uh, said in the same sentence. They're different pieces of technology. I uh, just wanted to show you what that is. Um, you can just basically think of it as be being a better python.exe, this kind of REPL, this place where you just type in commands. And we'll just very, very briefly, we don't have time to go into it in great depth, but we're at a command prompt, right? Nothing looks super special except there's a little color. But you get a bunch of really nice features. Like you can ask it for help on anything with just by typing in the name of the thing you're looking for help for and a question mark, either at the beginning or the end. And it also has really nice things like auto-completion. So Kevin here just typed in OS, one of the base modules. He pressed tab, and now we get auto-complete candidates, right, directly in our uh, command prompt. It also has this other layer called uh, magic commands. So that lets you do things like, if you ever had to copy and paste some Python code, it has a special mode which will deal with the indentation correctly. So you don't have to, like, sit there banging your head against the wall getting the indentation right. Um, and it can do things like timing code, and it can run scripts for you. So just the things that you use python.exe for, check out IPython. It, it ships with Pro, um, and you can also install it optionally with, uh, with a 10x system as well. Okay, and then the other thing that we, we don't have time to go into in too much depth, but you have seen Kevin demoing this whole time with, is this idea of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, check it out. It's really, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, where is this? Is this a replacement for X? And the answer is kind of no, it's not. It's a new way of doing things, right? It's like, is a, you know, is a podcast a radio show? It's like, well, no, it's like something different from those other things. So it's not, you know, it, you still at times will need an, an editor and you'll need to use something like IPython, some kind of more command line REPL environment. Um, it's a, just a new way of dealing with computing. It's especially useful for uh, anything where you need to interact with data sources that generate web-based output, or if you're, if you're trying to do any teaching, it's really awesome for teaching. As a number of places, it's great. It just is a complement to the other pieces of the technology stack you have. Now, that ships with uh, ArcGIS Pro 2.1. Again, it's open source. You can install it anywhere. Um, but you know, you'll probably see some cool stuff we're doing with that uh, in the near term if you haven't seen some of the things with the Python API already that integrate that. Now, if you're using that in Pro, it works with, with ArcPy as well, right? There's nothing special that only means it works with the Python API. Um, you can use both of those together at the same time. In fact, we'll, we'll talk about one piece of the software stack that does that already. So just want to, we don't have time to go into those in great depth. Want to put that on your radar though. Check those out. They're included with Pro. They're easy to install. Um, the one that we did want to get into with a little bit more depth is Pandas. Um, so what is Pandas? Basically, uh, Wes McKinney, uh, worked at a, you know, a hedge fund, uh, and he was doing a lot of R, but then he hit some problems with R. He's like, I just want to really use Python for doing the stuff I like with R. So R has this concept of data frames. They're actually derived from, from S. They go back to Bell Labs, like many of the technologies we use. And it's the idea of this panel data. It's a way of organizing observations into this structure. It just looks like a spreadsheet in some ways, but those records are labeled, right? They know what data type each column is. They, re they represent something more, uh, more consistent than what you get when you have uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And if you've ever had to clean an Excel spreadsheet that someone gave you from the field, you know exactly what I mean. It's not, you know, you could tell people that hey, you put numbers in here and then someone will write them out and they'll, they'll add little notes and you spend all this time just cleaning it up, right? So the data frame concept gets you this really rich representation and it, you get a lot by having that richer representation. You can do things like filter that data, query it, manipulate it very, very quickly in a way that you can't do when you just have the Excel spreadsheet-based view. Um, so it's kind of a really fundamental way of handling these tabular multidimensional data sets. Uh, those labels get you a lot more than you would have without them. I'll just show you a very, very super simple example. Um, I guess at this point I'm, I'm dating myself by showing this example, but I'm okay with that. Um, so one of my favorite television shows is The Simpsons. So I have some data here that's the seasonal ratings of 
the show, right? So all I do is I'm just reading in a CSV. That's just that simple data structure. Uh, and I can ask it for, so now I've got that into a data frame. I can ask it for its columns. So when I ask it for its columns, it's going to tell me what's in the CSV. What are the things that it, it contains? It contains a season, number of households, and you know this this is data that is from Nielsen. So now it's kind of useless. You know, people are watching it on their smartphones or whatever. But this is from the golden era of prime time television, when people sat in front of their TVs at a specific time and actually watched TV at all. So um, so let's look at look at what we can do with some just very very basic pandas, right? So instead of like maybe trying to pull in that CSV and then writing like a looping function in Python or taking all this data and writing it out to a database and writing some SQL statements, we can just do this directly using pandas. So all I've done here, this is a very, you know, this is not a world breaking analysis, but all I've done is I've asked the data frame for all the values where the prime time percentage of households was greater than 50%. So these are the years in which more than, I think, more than 50% of the people who are watching television at that moment were watching The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and so it just then, what, what this majority Simpsons object is going to be is this is going to be a new data frame. So we can chain these together, right? It really lends itself very nicely to kind of exploratory data analysis workflows because you can chain these operations together. Um, it has a number of ways that it can be very, very fast, um, so you can actually, by default, it'll persist these in memory, but these could be written out to a number of data stores that can re uh, represent this rich information, and you can then do things with it that don't require so much setup and, and prep with the data that you would if you had to work with just spreadsheets. So I just wanted to mention that, and, and also the fact that if you've seen any of the spatial data frame uh, capabilities of the Python API, that's what this is about. It's just extending that Panda's data frame model to have something else hanging off the end of that attribute table, right? You have geometries, and they're explicitly linked with that attribute table. It's this classic entity attribute model. It's both of those things together. And to have that, you have ArcPy plus ArcGIS API for Python to give you that. That's included in Pro. It's, it's in the box now. Um, and they're, we're doing a lot of stuff to try to make that experience even better. We're going to show you some non-spatial stuff right now. Um, but but just know that this is the same underlying underlying technology. Thanks, Sean. As Sean indicated, you know, a lot of our work simply deals with cleaning up the data. Even if we are spatial programmers, we need attributes associated with those locations, and those data often come across um, in a very very messy format. So. <clears throat> I have a data set here that I've gotten from the US Department of Transportation, their air carrier statistics. So for all of the airports in the world, it gives me origin destination. How many passengers started at one airport and went to another airport? And I want to analyze that data. They provide it in CSV format, but it happens to be zipped. But Pandas is pretty smart. Pandas CSV reader can actually read directly from zipped files. I don't have to eat up my hard drive space or remember where I unzipped these things to. So let me just quickly read those. I read about 168,000 records. You can see the pandas is pretty optimized. I think that's pretty fast to read 168,000 records. I want to peek at that data quickly, looking at the head of it, you can see I actually have a lot of information, the number of passengers, um, a, a carrier code, the origin, and the destination airport. And that's what I'm really most interested in. So I want to thin this data set down um, and really just look at the number of passengers, the origin airport, and the destination airport. If I were doing this in Excel, I would go in and start deleting columns and then start my analysis, and then realize immediately, uh-oh, I need that extra column that I just deleted 10 minutes ago. I'd have to re-download the data, okay? But you don't need to do that um, in Pandas. So what I can do is still refer to that original file, and I'm only going to say only use the columns that I'm interested in, which are the number of passengers, origin, and destination. Now when I look at that same data set, nice and clean. Oops, except lots of passengers, lots of origins and destinations, 
with zero passengers. So maybe I better look at these data very quickly. Like, what's the min, the max, and the mean for the number of passengers? Well, this is a really busy airport. I bet you a lot of my airports, because there's not direct flights between them, are going to have zero passenger counts. Okay? So I'm really only interested in analyzing the major air traffic corridors, where the, there's at least 10,000 passengers from the origin to the destination airport. I've built a query on that. I've not modified my underlying data. I've just applied a query to it. Now when I look at those data, I certainly have a minimum of about 10,000 um, and still this very large airport here. OK, but you saw that that was in tab tabular form, origin, destination, airport, origin, destination. That's not really um, that easy to see because I could have, <clears throat> and in fact, in this data set I do, I've got multiple records for each origin destination because they happen to provide these summaries on a monthly basis. I just want to collapse all of my data down and get one unique row for each origin destination airport. I can do that by using the group by function. While I'm grouping it, I'm going to ask it to aggregate the number of passengers by summing them up. Let's see what that data set would look like. Okay. So this, I believe, is Albuquerque to Atlanta, Albuquerque to Dallas. Already I'm seeing some interesting things in these data. Now again, this is in row order, row by row by row by row. I probably wouldn't want to include that in a report. What I really would want to see would be an origin destination matrix, wouldn't I? Um, so I can actually ask pandas to go ahead and take this table that we see here and to quickly pivot that table, um, summing up the values for the number of passengers in each one of those cells. And it indeed did that. So from Albuquerque to Atlanta, seems to be a lot of passengers. But most of these have none in them, meaning there's not a direct flight or there literally were no passengers. So I can take that same view of the data and just ask Pandas to fill in any NAs, any NANs, <laughs> with a zero. And now very quickly, I've summarized all of that origin destination data. I've summar summarized it temporally, and I've created a nice origin destination matrix that could go directly into my report or into my cluster analysis or into really any other kind of analysis. Um, I really like pandas. Um, I do a lot of data cleaning. And it's just very fast, very interactive to do. And I've only shown just scratch the surface of a lot of the cleanup um, and summarizing functions that Pandas has. And you're also seeing here, you know, a nice feature of Jupyter, right? We got these, you got your data, and now they're embedded in these little, you know, you can, you can navigate around here. You get a really nice way of interacting with that data, doing some exploration. Okay, great. Um, okay, so you know, a question that is becoming less relevant as we expand the stack more and more places is where is this and how fast is it? Um, so uh, it's a lot of places now. It's in Pro, it's in ArcMap, it's in Server. We've been shipping this, this core part of the stack for a number of releases. I work with a lot of academic people, and if they're less than three releases out of date, I'm really happy. <laughs> um, so I just want to mention that this is we've had this support for a long time. We are adding new things, of course, all the time. Like, Jupyter and IPython we just added recently to that base environment. But we're also doing things like making it faster. And I'll, I'll show you a quick example of, of what that looks like in a second. And we're doing things like allowing you to install any arbitrary package. Uh, Conda, uh, being able to take your environments, manage these more sophisticated stack, stacks of software. There's a lot happening there. Um, and with the ArcGIS API for Python, a lot of the examples you see, it's, it's something that can run in any place Python can run, right? You don't need to have ArcGIS uh, Pro or something to do it. You can just run it on your Mac or on, uh, on a server on Linux. Um, and 
these tools run in all those places as well, right? These are all cross-platform uh, packages. Um, so, so that's something is what we want want to give you that context. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, how fast does it perform? It's very fast. These are very highly optimized libraries. We ship a custom version of them uh, using this Intel MKL library, um, and it does a lot of really cool things. It does automated parallelization for all these workflows, um, and this is a chart that I'm going to just kind of hand wave and. And uh, you should take it with a giant grain of salt, but this shows you what it looks like going from no MKL to MKL of a single core to MKL of four cores. This is relative performance. Um, these look really impressive. Uh, in practice, you're not going to get these level of performance improvements. This is, uh, you know, a, a carefully selected choice to show where it's the best in some ways. Um, but in practice, this produces about two to ten x improvements in performance for uh, a lot of scientific uh, computations. Did you want to? No, oh, okay. Just in case. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is kind of just starting things out, right? If you saw some of the machine learning things, if you heard about that, or um, you, you know, decided you want to change jobs and get more money because you became a data scientist, a spatial data scientist, then this is a starting point for a lot of those technologies, right? Um, we've kind of helped, hopefully, help connect some of that in your mind where these things fit together. But there's a lot of really cool stuff in the Python ecosystem machine learning, deep learning, Bayesian. Um, there's uh, another module called PyStan that I didn't list here. Uh, even frequentist statistics. There's some stuff with stat models, some other places. And you can do really cool things that aren't even just purely Python, but you could drive them with Python. So TensorFlow, a lot of the, the APIs that are coming out for machine learning, they know how much better Python is for the average developer. So even if all the back-end code is written in some secret sauce or some other language, the actual interface you use is written in Python. So that's a really great thing. Uh, Great for us, who those of us who use Python. Now, these resources, I want to leave a little time for questions, so I'm going to like not actually look at these slides. But the idea here is if you download that, that repository, you'll have all these links here for you to look at. Basically, there's, there's everything from what to do if you're new to Python, or what are some connection points if I'm GIS-focused dealing with Python. Courses, there's a lot of really great courses that are all free op online for this. Um, you know, there's some great books that I recommend checking out. Uh, there's some paid materials. Um, deeper dive into some things. Uh, deeper code examples I couldn't show you today. Toolboxes that are especially about combining deep scientific analysis with ArcGIS that you could use today. Uh, and some conferences. Python's really big on community. There's really great resources out there. These could be local. Um, there's local conferences and local meetups often for Python. There's also really big things like PyCon, which is coming up in a couple of months. And SciPy. Uh, SciPy is probably the best conference I've been to, excepting this one, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, there's some really cool things going on out there in the, in the overall space. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, there's a lot of people involved in doing this. We're really happy to be uh, to work with all these great people. Um, but also, there's really great contributions coming from the community. A lot of this work I've just shown you is coming from these open source projects and and people contributing. So you know you. Feel free to contribute yourself. It doesn't. You don't have to be an expert in these things to participate in this, the software development process. Um, okay, so I think that's it. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end here. Um, if you can rate us in the application, we appreciate it. If you don't have an iOS or Android device, then uh, we will take cuneiform tablets. Yeah. Akkadian <laughs> only, please. I'm not going to read any Babylonian today. Um, all right. Uh, I think I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great.